Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars and Auto House of Naples on another, well, you know, it's a paradisical sort of Florida. Yeah, you know what? I don't know what the hell day today is. I think it's Wednesday, but I'm not sure. Uh, it's nice. It's like 62 degrees. It's about perfect. Uh, if only it would stay this way all day, I'd be thrilled. But the fact is, it's going to heat up again. The tropical sun is going to come out at some point and, you know, get us into the mid-80s somewhere, which I understand is a nice weather situation for people who are, you know, freezing or shoveling snow. But, you know, again, it's just not what I want. And I feel like we're being cheated out of another winter. You just want the odd cold snap every now and again to keep things in perspective and to present a big difference between the miserable shitty July days that are honestly right around the corner. This winter is already hauling ass and, you know, it's soon going to be over. Uh, this, uh, what, the virus thing. We've got this Omicron, Omicron, whatever the hell you call it, some kind of COVID AIDS hybrid that's spreading like wildfire. Uh, my sister went to Ireland for Christmas. Uh, she lived there for many years and her husband's from there. So despite all the obvious reasons not to go, they went. And apparently their youngest child, as children do, uh, was immediately infected. So now it's caused all sorts of drama. Uh, they're stuck over there. They can't fly back. Uh, apparently my brother-in-law has, you know, got nothing to do but drink pints of Guinness all day. So it's a really miserable time for them. Uh, she asked me to go over to Fort Lauderdale. I'm not making this up. And retrieve her car from long-term parking to, you know, save the fees from stacking up. I mean, you got to be shitting me. What, what is my time worth? I mean, <laughs> I could, yeah, like I, I told her I'll just write her a check for whatever it is. I mean, are you kidding me that I'm going to go over there and retrieve this? That she's going to express mail the keys to me so I can go over and grab this, whatever shitty SUV it is they drive and bring it back. Yeah, okay. I'm all over that, Suzanne. All over it. Can't wait to do that. But anyway, look, I digress, and I'm not going to start rambling on. A quick update. We got the weather out of the way. The animal situation is, is absolute zero. I mean, a few birds, a rabbit this morning, that was it. So uh, God has blessed me by keeping the animals away, and I'm going to enjoy that for as long as I can. I, I think it's worth remembering that nature, in its truest, most beautiful state, uh, desperately wants to kill you. Uh, but for the moment, I've been given a reprieve for that. So let's just leap right into this car. And uh, this is, it's honestly a special treat for me. And yeah, I know I've done uh, cars like this before, and I don't care. I'll do everyone that crosses my path because I absolutely love them. Uh, this is a 1989 Mercedes-Benz 300CE. Uh, it's part of the famed W124 lineup. This is technically a C124 because it's a coupe, uh, but uh, it is part of the uh, the venerable W124. And this video is going to answer the question, is it the last great Mercedes? This is not a new question concerning this car. In fact, it's been overdone, but I don't give a shit. I'm going to do it anyway. And uh, the short answer to that question is yes. Yes, this is the last true great Mercedes. So if that's why you tuned in, uh, consider the question answered and you don't have to spend any more time thinking about whether it's true or not, at least from this perspective. Uh, but others of you can keep tuning in to see why. Um, yeah, they're, they're, okay, so this is the coupe, the C124. There are a bunch of varieties of the, uh, the W124. The, the W would have denoted a sedan, a four-door. Uh, the S124 uh, would have been the estate or the wagon. Uh, there was also an A124, which was the cabriolet, a V124, which was a limousine, and then it gets tedious from there. Uh, long story short, it was a multi-tiered platform from Mercedes-Benz at a time when they used to do that sort of thing. It's not really how they build cars anymore, uh, but back then when this car was built, that is how they did it. And uh, again, as many others have argued before, and 
I'll keep going with it. Uh, the 124 may well be the finest car ever made. Uh, and never mind Mercedes. It may just be the finest car ever made. Uh, it was certainly one of the most influential. And uh, frankly, I tend to agree with both of those sentiments. Uh, looking back on these cars in history is a little bit like finding Abraham Lincoln's CD collection. I mean, they're just... They were that far ahead of their time. They were that far removed from everything. You know, comparing it to what was going around at the time just isn't fair. I mean, it has so many advanced features of what would become standard practice five or even ten years later. It, it represented an absolute sea change in the automotive world and signaled the absolute end of the uh, malaise era, which was, of course, already waning by this time. Uh, but a few different forces came together to make that so. Uh, some of them were big, obvious, and some of them were subtle. Um, First off, it was a car that was made by Mercedes to replace an absolute legend, and that was the W123, uh, which was also available in coupes and uh, never a convertible, but certainly sedans and estate wagons and rolling chassis and that sort of thing. And uh, that car really... It, I won't say it brought diesel to America, but it was a strong influence in why diesel was so popular in this country in the early 80s. Uh, the problem is nobody could really duplicate the legendary Mercedes diesels uh, that were going into those cars at the time. Uh, I still think the W123, one could argue it's the finest car that's ever built. I'm going to make a very small distinction and say that it's the finest machine <laughs> that may have ever been built. And I don't mean that in the way people say, oh, that's a great machine. Uh, I mean that in terms of actual engineering talk, where it is a machine, you know, a very basic moving parts, this, that, the other. Uh, the W123 was an absolutely incredible feat of production and quality and engineering. But I think the 124 edges it out in terms of being a better car, uh, in terms of what a car should be. So, yeah, we're going to get into that. Um, but anyway, that W123 was globally renowned uh, for its quality and durability, maybe a lesser extent at styling. That's you know, more debatable. And uh, that's part of the force that made this car came to be because it had to replace it. And it <laughs> so look, when you're replacing a legend, it has to be good. It has to be a great car. Uh, it's what Ford and Chevy face every time they replace one of their big trucks. Very same thing. I mean, it's one thing to replace a model that's waning in popularity, that's getting long in the tooth, that isn't selling very well. That's easy. Uh, but when Mercedes or Ford or Chevy has to replace a bread and butter part of their lineup, uh, you know, for Ford, the F-150, or for Chevy, the, you know, full-size trucks, man, the pressure is on. I mean, you know, the new one has to be as good as the old one, which is still selling well, still powerful popular and is a huge part of their revenue stream. If they get it wrong, fortunes and futures are going to go up in smoke. I mean, it's a, it's a very, very big deal. And that was the amount of pressure that was on Mercedes when they were going to replace the uh, uh, W123 to a good, you know, for their they were up to the task, long story short. It was a good time to for Mercedes. Um, it, the company was at a peak, probably, in the late 70s and the early 1980s. They were making money. They'd made a ton of money. They had an incredible wealth of talent in terms of engineers and designers and management. Uh, they, all of these new technologies were becoming available to them in a way that weren't before and everything just sort of came together uh, to make uh, a pretty incredible car at the time and uh, it still holds true today um, the engineers were running the show back then and the designers and anybody but the accountants the accountants at Mercedes-Benz uh, were definitely not uh, you know, <laughs> anywhere near the top of the chain they were confined to these little cold windowless offices 
offices in the bottom of the corporate headquarters. And uh, the cars were built to a standard and not a cost. The engineers would design them, uh, or I'm sorry, forgive me, the, uh, the designers would design them, the engineers would make it come to fruition. And the way that it would cost at the end of it was not the primary concern. They'd slap a price tag on it later, uh, but their primary mission uh, was to build a fantastic car, and that's what they did. And so they had all this money, all this talent. They had modern design tools that were coming in, like wind tunnels and computer-aided drafting, modern construction techniques that allowed for the use of light metals and structural bonding and uh, all sorts of things that gave it an integrity that wasn't available there. Uh, we got birds coming in. Anyway, that gave it an integrity that wasn't um, wasn't available before in terms of mass production. Uh, also, you had the uh, the world emerging from the sort of crisis laden shitbox stuff of the '70s. You know, there was a renewed sense of optimism. Uh, people thought the future might actually start to be better, and uh, I think that did culminate in a finer car and all across the all across the world actually I think that sort of optimism really uh, came through in what was being built at the time and uh, yeah, you finally had an end to this sort of propped up stuff that you know the carryovers from the 70s and you know where they came up with grills and chrome and opera windows to make up for what was lacking under the hood you know finally the technology was starting to catch up to it and uh, that was a good thing uh, you know they even if the future was pretty good at the time I do have to say we were living under the threat of global thermonuclear war and that one you know, a little aside to the snowflakes out there and I say that with love I, I I really do. I, I love you guys. I re you know, now that I'm working with snowflakes down at Auto House, I understand you all a little bit better. And uh, I promise you there's love in my heart. But let me tell you that our doomsday scenario was a shitload more macho than yours. I'm not saying that to be cruel. I'm just saying because it's a fact. I mean, worrying that it's like 0.3 degrees colder in Antarctica and that someday this could lead to problems is a lot different from worrying that it would be 12 million degrees warmer uh, instantaneously uh, in the next second if Ronald Reagan had his way. I mean, it was it's a very, very different world. It was a doomsday threat that you could absolutely sink your teeth into. And uh, it just, um, you know, it, it sort of down the way kids our age back then thought so yeah I get it maybe the world's gonna warm up a little bit uh, you know it's fine I, I'm keeping my eyes on our ever-changing climate I am I'm not opposed to it I'm not one of those uh, what do you call them deniers I'm sure it's all getting bad and terrible uh, it's just that I've got my canary in the coal mine and that's the price of Malibu beachfront real estate um, I know that people in California are way more attuned to this thing than I am they're paying much more attention to it. So the minute that Malibu beachfront real estate starts tanking, uh, that's the minute that I know we've got problems. But anyway, look, I digress. Let me get back into this. All of these things came together at just the right time uh, to produce the 124, a car that seemed a couple of generations ahead of anything else that was out there. I mean, it was like something akin to, you know, Marty McFly flying in in the DeLorean in 1955. I mean, there was just nothing else like it. Uh, it seemed like two generations ahead of the W123 that it replaced. It was lighter, but it was more structurally rigid. Uh, it had a much more modern suspension, which was based on the... Um, on the baby Benz, if you remember the 190E that came out in the 80s, a fantastic little car by all accounts. Uh, it had this trailing link suspension in the back, very modern, uh, now being used in basically every you know, mid-size sedan out there, but it was new at the time. And this car borrowed a lot from that and uh, made it into an even better thing. Uh, the Baby Benz was a great success for Mercedes. It was a big risk for them. And uh, even if it turned out to be a great little car, I think it did plant the seed for the ultimate doom that would befall the company. And uh, frankly, why they're building such shit cars today. But yeah, anyway, we'll get into that later. Um, it, aerodynamics. This car was incredible incredibly aerodynamic. It had, I think, the lowest drag coefficient of just about anything out there at the time, despite being 
it sacrificed nothing in terms of its greenhouse, its headroom. Uh, it even looks stodgy and boxy in some ways, and yet the thing just absolutely slipped through the air. Uh, it used underbody panels, plastics to help smooth airflow, flush glass, all sorts of little subtle features that helped it cheat the wind. And uh, of course, that would make it much more stable at high speeds and uh, improve its uh, fuel economy. It even introduced these 15-hole uh, manhole wheels that, uh, that there was, this was the first Benz to have them and they went on to become like the most prolific and influential wheel of the 80s. I get tired saying influential but every damn part of this car is. Uh, but uh, anyway they came out on this thing and uh, they're just instantly recognizable. They eventually made their way to just about every other Benz product. So um, the, the car was just absolutely ahead of its time. The safety of the car <laughs> and the engineering in that you had crumple zones. Uh, you had a dashboard that was designed to absorb human body impact painlessly. You had pedals that would collapse towards the firewall in a crash. Uh, it was one of the first cars designed to have offset crash protection in the front and the rear. So, you know, if the cars hit a concrete barrier at an awkward angle, it still kept the passenger cabin intact, still let the doors all be opened without the use of the jaws of life and uh, the standards that this car set went on to become the uh, basically the standards for the future of safety at least in European cars and most probably American cars as well. Uh, it pioneered airbags, one of the first cars to have dual side airbags, uh, pre-tension seat belts, uh, height adjustable seat belts. Uh, the list just goes on and on. There were so many safety features in this car uh, that um, again everywhere you look Every aspect of this car, whether it be, uh, you know, mechanical engineering, style, uh, ergonomics, so much of it was influential on the cars that would get made uh, later on. Uh, even this car had the first Mercedes formatic system, the first all-wheel drive system, uh, that of course would make things much safer in, you know, slippery, wintry lands that, you know, required more traction. And it was powerful. I mean, in its first incarnation, it had this inline six engine. It's called the M103. A fairly straightforward inline six, but a big sucker, and it put out 180 horsepower, which may not sound like much today, but was pretty damn impressive at the time. Uh, you know, 180 horsepower was nearing Mustang GT and Camaro Z28 levels, and frankly, the acceleration from these early uh, 124 cars rivaled them, and it would probably go on to a much higher top speed as well. It was, uh, I think they would run about 150 miles an hour or so. Uh, of course, cruising the Autobahn was a big part of their uh, shtick. <clears throat> so, you know, the car, again, in that regard, did away with the Malays era. It was a pretty peppy and pretty potent car. Uh, in 87, they had a turbo diesel engine that they borrowed from the bigger S-Class, and when they stuffed it in the 124, it became the uh, fastest road-going diesel sedan that had ever been produced. So uh, a lot of firsts for Mercedes with this thing and a lot of impressive cars. They never did put a diesel in the uh, coupes, by the way. They were always gas-powered. Uh, but within a few years, basically every car on the road would be in. I mean, if you look at Cadillac in particular, what they were building when this car came out and what they built a few years later uh, could... I, I, it's hard to miss the influence of the W124 uh, on the cars that Cadillac uh, was building. And that is the power of this thing. This is how influential it was. And it's part of what I say goes into making it one of the greatest cars of all time. Uh, it was the bread and butter car for Mercedes. This was a time they were building different. You know, they... Nobody builds cars now the way Mercedes was building then. And this car, when it came out, was meant to be extremely prolific across a wide range of needs. I mean, uh, there were sedans, wagons, coupes, uh, convertibles, commercial vehicles, rolling chassis, uh, long and short wheelbase versions. They were used for taxis, police cars, fire trucks, ambulances, hearses, uh, pope mobiles, and more. I, I mean, this was just a very durable and versatile platform uh, that could be used in a variety of situations and do so with 
uh, great comfort. So uh, to call it one of the most influential cars in history is not at all a stretch. And frankly, it did it all while performing its duties with poise and grace and elegance and subtlety and, you know, still being true to the Benz product line and the looks and, uh, and obviously, of course, the humorless German attitude inherent to any 80s Mercedes. So um, it's just, to me, an incredible piece. This one, of course, is a coupe, a two-door, probably my favorite, although that's a little bit of a toss-up between this and the wagon. Uh, the wagon is maybe where my heart is, but I think the coupe is just a better-looking car. Uh, the roof line is lower. Uh, it's got a sort of a sleeker uh, elegance that I just find incredibly appealing. And uh, they did retain the hard cop, uh, uh, the hard top coupe style, where all four windows could go down, leaving a wide open space on either side of the car with no B pillars and uh, frameless glass, which I think is just terrific. Uh, I think the car has a more elegant look than the bourgeoisie cabriolets where the top went down. I, I just think the coupe is where it's at, and uh, that's why I absolutely love them. Um, I tell you what, I'm going to take a pause here for a minute, get my shit together, and uh, that was the overview. So now we're going to just dive into this specific coupe, and uh, maybe we'll even have a reasonably length video today. <laughs> we'll see. You know, I guess I've done enough of these things that I don't need to labor over them too much. I might put some links in. I'm not going to do a history of 89 either. I just did one, I think, on that Mercury Cougar uh, from a few weeks ago. So I'll just put that link in the uh, description as well. So uh, bear with me a moment. I'm going to take a quick, quick break, and then we'll get right back into it. All right, so let's just get back into this. Uh, as you can see, the motorhome's gone. That means that Peter is off <sighs> gallivanting around God knows where, spending his fortune, flaunting around with all the Tinderellas he finds and, you know, lighting cigars with $100 bills and drinking the blood of orphans or, you know, whatever it is that he does when he's not hanging around here. Meanwhile, of course, I'm left, you know, struggling to get by, making soup out of ketchup and water, and, uh, you know, working for the man the way that I have to keep doing it. It's just, you know, I don't know. I mean, if I ever need confirmation that life isn't fair, Peter is there to provide that for me. Uh, he certainly is, so uh, give him credit for that. Um, I'm loaded up on the whiskey, on the coronavirus whiskey, uh, a double, maybe triple the normal amount. Again, uh, from what I hear, this Omicron thing is flying around the place, so I need all the protection I can get. And uh, that is undoubtedly going to emanate in the reviews of these cars. So bear with me. I'll try to struggle through and keep as much, uh, you know, sentient ability around me as I can. And we're just going to get right back flying into this car and get it over with and get it done. Okay, again, 89300CE. Uh, the lettering and numbering systems on these cars, it's interesting. This car, the 124, was truly the first E-Class Mercedes. It didn't happen until much later in the game. I want to say 1993 uh, was the year that it became the E. And the E in this car does not have anything to do with the class of car that it is, the 300 CE. Uh, Mercedes in this era were much truer to their, uh, their lettering and numbering system. So with 300 CE, like this car, basically meant that the car had a three liter, uh, six cylinder ammo. It didn't mean six, but a three liter engine. Uh, C denoted coupe and E denoted fuel injection. Uh, well, as time went on, carburetors, you know, basically went away and every car is fuel injected, so you don't really need it as a designator. Uh, people were already kind of calling it an E at the time, so Mercedes just went with it. And uh, they all became the uh, E class and it became the E320. Uh, there was also the C class and, of course, the S class. Uh, and this car got its second redesign in in the early 90s, I think at 93, 4, whatever, to, to look more like the 140 car, the S-Class at the time, uh, which is a terrific car, but also a big problematic thing for Mercedes. We'll get one of those again and do that someday, but we'll keep with this car today and keep the styling in line with what became the C-Class, the you know, 190E developed into that. So, um, But the 124 had the true roots going back to the 80s 
trees while those other two cars were moving forward into a darker time for Benz that would uh, really reach a peak when the A-Class came out at the end of the 90s. But uh, anyway, we'll get into all that as we go. Uh, so th look, the styling of this car is unmistakably Mercedes, and that is another part of its strength. Uh, you've got the classic grill up front, the radiator grill in chrome. They didn't get rid of that, despite how modern the car looked at the time. Uh, you've got a stand-up hood ornament, uh, you know, the three uh, prongs of the star, one point in land, one at sea, and one at air, and Mercedes is going to dominate all of them. Uh, you've got these sort of flush glass uh, headlights now with the wipers, you know, designed to, of course, keep you able to see at night in all conditions. Uh, five mile an hour bumpers had been integrated really nice and easy. The tow hook cover is missing from this one. It drives me ape shit. Uh, but they're frankly more valuable now than the corresponding weight in plutonium. I think they've got one ordered. They're going to put on when it gets here, but eh, who has the time to wait? Uh, but the front end of the car is unmistakably a Mercedes product and very elegant, very lovely and uh, regal, if you will, while at the same time having German an understatement. More birds. Oh, great. And the tree right above me. They're going to take a shit on my head. Um, and airplanes. So we've got it all going on. That's great. That's the noisiest friggin' airplane I've heard. And I think it's landing on this street. Oh, God. It's one of those weird Italian things. I, mean, I can't remember what they're called, but the engine's pointing the wrong way. Uh, anyway, we'll keep going the hell with it. Uh, you see the very nice subtle lines from the grill extending back on the hood. Uh, you've got slab sides, basically. Uh, this car, the, the coupe's got that lower cladding a little bit earlier than the rest of the lineup. Uh, I think it was 1990 before uh, the other cards got those... Um, uh, those Sacco cladding things down the side, but it looks terrific, and I think that helped make the coupe look more modern when it came out. There's all these little subtleties, like the way the hood is swept up past the fenders for aerodynamics. Of course, that forces the air uh, in a way that goes over the top of the car, in a way that cuts down its wind resistance. And again, that's the sort of styling and engineering that went into this thing. Uh, it's got this eccentric single wiper uh, that extends extends out in the middle as it goes up so it can hit more of the windshield uh, than it would be able to with either two wipers uh, or, um, you know, without having that little eccentric thing. It's a neat feature. Uh, you've also got the, there's some debate over this. You know, I've, it's, it's plagued me for years that I haven't had the correct answer. Uh, but you see how it has the two different sized side view mirrors. You've got sort of a longer rectangular one on the driver's side and a square one on the right side. Now, I do believe that's, I think that's for, okay, so look, it's a passing mirror on the left because, of course, Mercedes uh, and Germans are very proper about their highway rules. So that's the mirror you want when you're passing. Uh, you can see more of the cars behind you stuff in your lane. Uh, this one, this, uh, I think it's convex mirror. It's, you know, objects are closer than they appear. I think this one helps with parking, which, of course, you're going to do in Europe. Uh, there's more parallel street parking, and this car might help you get a better view of the uh, sidewalk. But I'm sure someone in the comment section will correct me on that, and that's fine. Uh, if you really, truly have the correct answer as to why those mirrors are that way, I'd like to hear it, because I've never really gotten it from an official Mercedes source. Uh, again, the aero wheels, which would come out on the later cars uh, after this one, uh, well, by every car had it by 89, but in 86 they were just coming out, uh, and in 85 in Europe it had it. Uh, the flush glass down the side, you know, again for aerodynamics, and again, the way it sealed was terrific. I mean, it's silent inside this car. Not quite flush door handles, because I think Mercedes likes having it in such a way that you can grip from the top or bottom in a convenient way that isn't annoying. Audi made perfectly flush door handles, but I found them annoying to use. Uh, again, with the lowered roof line, I think is stunning. Uh, beautifully angled uh, back pillar going into that uh, rear quarter panel, which has a lovely belt line that follows the uh, top of the car. Uh, Mercedes put these little guys in here 
that would pop up. You see there's a receptacle in there for, uh, you know, whatever it is you'd want to hang, like some sort of a ski rack. So you can be like James Bond going to the Alps with your skis on top or cargo carriers or what have you. Uh, but from every angle, I think the car is just subtle and attractive and beautifully styled. Really, really nice to look at. Uh, when this car first came out, this sort of angular trunk was a little bit controversial and not everybody loved it uh, but as time went on everybody copied it so there you go uh, it also still had the rib taillights that are um, you know a signature Mercedes thing back then uh, that was designed so snow or dirt or dust it might pile up on the outer edge of the light but you could still see the inner part and the lights would still be visible uh, you know these cars were true European imports still back then you see the way that uh, American license plate doesn't quite jibe with the way the um, uh, the way it bolts on. It's a little bit too long, and it's got this wide area that's much more suited to a Euro plate. Uh, you know, now of course they've got different back panels to suit different plates because it's cheap and easy to produce. Uh, but I think there was something cool about the way uh, that uh, you could tell it was a distinctly European car that was imported over here, even as a U.S. model, uh, based on the way the license plate fit. Uh, you've got, uh, you know, a little you know, rear view, rear view, yeah, I love that. See, that's the whiskey talking. You've got the antenna there. I like the shadow trim that it's got. It's not chrome, it's not silver, it's just something kind of in between, and I think that looks terrific. Uh, just everything about the car is lovely, in my opinion. All right, let's get inside the trunk. So you do that with that big chrome push button down there. And, oh, God, I've got crap in the back. Stole my wrapping paper. Oh, the hell with it. I'll just leave it in there. Uh, the snowflakes were on vacation, so I, I got them presents, but I didn't wrap them because I'm lazy, so I have to go in and do that today. Uh, but anyway, you can see that the trunk is finished in the same burgundy color the interior is. It's nice and big. You can fit a ton of crap in there. Uh, these little things here explain how the keys work. You can use the trunk to lock the car by twisting it. You can turn the trunk into a safe in the sense that if you use the hard lock on it that comes up here, uh, it's going to take a crowbar to get in there. You get under here, you've got a uh, floor-mounted spare tire, nice full size on a factory alloy. Uh, there's the little bag of tools still with the car. There's all the jacking stuff, and uh, just a you know a very well-engineered, lovely place to have a spare tire and an extremely useful trunk overall. Have a look under the hood. The sun's starting to become annoying. Before we get into the interior, I may have to pull it up a little farther. All right, so I got to do this thing one-handed. These little fragile things that come out here, uh, you pull them to release the uh, dual-sided uh, hood latches, and if you do it wrong, you'll just snap them right off. But okay, so here it is. Here is an M103 engine. Uh, this is a fabled, fabled Mercedes inline six, known for reliability and pep and durability and all sorts of good things. Uh, you can see uh, the exhaust manifold still has a lot of that white coating on it, and that's because this is such a well preserved, low mileage car. Uh, those, you know, I mean, you could put hundreds of thousands of miles on these cars, uh, but by the time you do, most of that white coating has uh, gone away. Uh, there's never really been a bad inline six-cylinder engine in anything. And, of course, the Mercedes just brings it to another level of this era of this era. Uh, they replaced it with the M104, which was a dual cam, uh, overhead cam engine that is also, <laughs> it's a great engine and it's very peppy, but you know, the modernity, there's the whiskey, the modernity of it uh, also brought in some decline. Like they were known for needing more head gaskets. They uh, went to the sort of biodegradable, environmental wiring harness crap that degraded a hell of a lot faster than they intended. and that became a problem. Uh, so to me, even with less power, uh, I do think the uh, M103 is the uh, preferable engine. Uh, like earlier Mercedes, it has the, um, the hood service position. This is going to be hard one-handed, but I'll try. See so you poke out that little guy there. Come over and get this little guy here. And then you can push the hood up into this straight up and down thing. 
uh, which works fantastic for the uh, technician who's servicing your car. It gives them all kinds of room. Uh, it's particularly useful of adjusting the valves on the diesel version, at least in the 123s. I don't know if you have to lash the valves the way you did on those things and these things, but uh, either way, it's a terrific way for a uh, technician to work on a car. And uh, Basically, one of the indicators that Mercedes was trying to build a forever car, a true luxury item uh, that um, would last for as long as you were willing to maintain it. Uh, this was made into a four-speed automatic. I mean, in Europe, they had four cylinders and diesels and all sorts. I mean, there were like 20 different engines you could get in this thing uh, over the course of years from a tiny little four-cylinder to a six-liter V8. I mean, all kinds of stuff. Uh, but but uh, in America, we tended to just stick with this um, uh, inline six, and then they got a uh, eight cylinder, and then the 500E, which I had, uh, the greatest car ever built, in my opinion, and Peter clawed it away from me, but that's another story. Uh, but um, that was made into four speed automatics or five speed automatics. You could get stick shifts in Europe, particularly with the diesel, uh, but I'm almost positive there were no manual gearboxes released in the States. And I think by the time 95, 96 rolled along and the last few of these were coming off the line, uh, they did come with five-speed automatic transmissions. But I'm sure some Benz geek will correct me on that. Uh, but anyway, everything nice and proper under there and uh, over-engineered, over-built. You see the ABS pump. Uh, you know, this car is just epic in my mind. Uh, Four-wheel independent suspension. Again, you've got the trailing links in the back. Very modern way. Uh, it, 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 you sort of mimic to the Citroen system. There was a pneumatic version you could get that balanced. This one doesn't have it, I don't believe, because I don't see the reservoir for it, but um, it would uh, hydraulically level the car. Uh, but Mercedes also cleverly put in proper springs as well so that it didn't count on it when it was resting. So you'll never see a 124 with its ass end sitting on the ground the way you will an old town car or some other pneumatically controlled car where the fluid leaks out or it loses pressure. Uh, that was a pretty crafty thing by Benz, in my opinion. Uh, and of course, the car's handled incredibly well. Uh, we talked earlier about the Mustang GTs and the um, uh, Camaro Z28s, how this would, eh, you know, not quite match it, but close in terms of acceleration, certainly exceeded in top speed. Uh, it also handled virtually as well as those cars did by the virtue it's a lot of virtue, by the virtue of how well the engineering uh, was set up in the suspension. So just a terrific car in every single facet of its engineering. And uh, that's why, of course, when they came out, well, that first 300D was probably the equivalent of like 70, 80 grand in today dollars. Uh, and it was expensive, but it did represent a good value for the money and the fact that you could just drive it and get all the money out of it for as many years as you could. And there is a shocking number of one. 24 still on the road today. Uh, you know, they go from being high-end cars driven by classy people to wine and cheese events to, you know, 20 years later, they're being used as taxis in Uganda. So uh, it's just a car that is globally appreciated for what it can deliver and how it works. And uh, I'm... <laughs> I'll try and trim it off there. I'm going to pause again, get all my shit inside the car, and uh, then we're going to hop in, do the interior, and go for a spin. Bear with me. All right, I think I've got us out of the sun enough to get this covered and go for a spin. So let's see what we got inside. Okay, so what we have inside is extremely elegant and attractive. Uh, the car is finished in smoke silver outside, which I think is an absolutely lovely and uh, very classic Mercedes color. And uh, it's got burgundy leather inside, uh, including the dash, which I think looks terrific. It's almost like a wine edition car. You know, you've got your whites and your reds. And uh, I don't know, to me, it's just one of my favorite color combos in this car. I think it looks great. Uh, the fit and finish is a legend. Legendary, and there's still a ton of old Mercedes in it, uh, which is again part of what makes it such a terrific car today. Uh, you got these lovely little chrome caps on the doors. You've got the uh, traditional style Mercedes latch system that's like a bank vault. Uh, you got all kinds of. This is sort of pre. 
uh, they, they got a more high-end audio system in later years that was meant to compete with Lexus, which was giving Mercedes some trouble. Uh, but uh, this one is early enough to not have it. So you've got great gun storage. Uh, you got a little spot here where you can put narcotics or weapons or whatever it is you like. Uh, more big Mac pop it. Ma yeah. <sighs> map pockets up there to do uh, more of the same. Uh, you've got these sort of representational seat switch uh, power things where it looks like the seat and it's easy to adjust on the fly with your memory, your one and two position. A manual mirror on the driver's side because it's right there. A power mirror on the passenger side because it's not. That's that's the kind of lovely, cool German engineering that I absolutely miss, that you just never get anymore. Uh, terrific compartmentalized carpet, uh, very nice, very supportive seats amongst the best in the business. A little push button release here. Uh, in the back, you've basically got four buckets, so uh, two Canadians, not three, go back there. Uh, you've got a uh, little armrest for them so they can get that going. You've got this neat little center console area. Not a bad place to store. So yeah, that is an ashtray. Not a bad place to score guns and drugs, but you're going to see them. They're not that easy to uh, uh, to conceal. And under here, you've got a um, uh, decrepit old uh, first aid kit that actually looks like someone had used it in recent times. Nice to see it there, but I mean, if you try to use any of these 30 or 40 year old band-aids at this point, uh, I don't know if it's going to work well for you. Uh, you have window switches back there, which are nice and uh, everything looking lovely. And we'll show these when I get in and start it up. Uh, but these little humps in the back panels are the seatbelt presenters, uh, which was a neat feature. All right, so let's have a seat. I'll fire this thing up. Nice traditional Mercedes key. Slide it in here. Oh, for the love of God. I'm going to break an elbow doing this. Uh, you do have that sort of irritating Mercedes buzzer, like the U-boat is sinking. Uh, I mean, come on, man. Make that a little more peaceful. And, uh, oh, God, I'm going to turn that down. Here are these seatbelt presenters that I'm talking about, where it, uh, an arm extends and makes it easy for you to grab this thing. And once I click it in, that arm is going to retract back into its little receptacle, and that's kind of a cool feature. Uh, they're known for braking, but of course that's more from misuse than it is from uh, an inherently bad design the way it would be in a BMW product. Uh, you've got a very traditional Mercedes headlight system over here, all manual. Another thing I love about this car, Mercedes resisted the urge to put a bunch of gimmetry, gimmickry in it, like auto lights and whatnot. So zero is zero, that's off. Uh, some people turn it off like this and they end up with a dead battery because if on is all the way to the uh, passenger side, off must be all the way to the driver's side. Well, not so. Zero Zero, straight up and down is off. Uh, these are the city parking lights where you can light up uh, either the left or right side of the car if you're sort of parked on the side of the road temporarily to indicate to people that, you know, hey, keep an eye out for this thing. Uh, put on the parks and then the headlights. Uh, one pole gives you the front fog lights. Two poles gives you the rear fog lights and that's another thing I've seen people do is drive around with this big bright rear fog light on which looks ridiculous they want to have their front fogs on for looks but they pull too far and uh, then they're driving around with what looks like one lit up brake light so crazy uh, it's a power uh, telescoping wheel doesn't tilt up and down just in and out uh, you got the Mercedes classic cruise control set up here a little stock almost impossible to uh, confuse with the uh, uh, the wiper control which is here and a nice feature uh, this one does have an airbag of course Mercedes was early in getting those beautiful black leather grip I Mercedes wheels of this vintage are just terrific. Uh, also a very classic Mercedes instrument cluster. You've got your uh, fuel and you know all these sort of cool German hieroglyphics at the time which seemed so exotic to me as a kid. You had R for refill, 1-1. One, one. <laughs> I mean it's just very different from E and F. Uh, you've got your uh, temperature in Celsius. You've got your oil pressure uh, there on the other side and of course the economy gauge which is vacuum control 
old and lets you know if you've got any economy going. Uh, there's 160 mile an hour speedo. You see just 78,000 miles on the clock of this. I mean, it's just getting started, this car. And uh, attack with a 6200 RPM red line and a whole row of these sort of cool German warning lights underneath your battery, your brake. This gives you brake wear if uh, the indicators go off. This is low oil. This is low water, low washer fluid. This means you have a light out. It measures the resistance of the bulbs. This is an ABS problem. This is a SRS problem, and that's a check engine. So, uh, all very, and there it is. <laughs> check engine is on. As you know, you just can't make this shit up. You really honestly can't. So, uh, I guess when we get back to the shop, we're going to go ahead and check the engine and see what's up with that. There's the legendary reliability of the Mercedes platform. Let's see if I restart it, if that comes back on. Oh, God, that's funny. Alright, we'll, we'll keep an eye on that. Uh, over here you've got your uh, vents, you've got your uh, turn them off with this thing, steer them with that. They give you these cool little angle guys so you can see which direction the air is going in. All very nice stuff. Uh, you've got a glove box that would later go on to become uh, a uh, airbag place that's that's a very technical scientific term uh, this is as close as you get to cup holders in this car it's just sort of a little place for maybe your picnic lunch uh, rear defrost uh, this is cool this will knock down the rear headrests in sort of a violent way we'll see if you can see that in the rearview mirror Okay, so that scares the shit out of people who press it without knowing what's going to happen. Uh, this recirculates the air, uh, hazards, antenna, interior lights, your uh, absolutely indecipherable Mercedes climate control. Uh, putting it in the center is where you actually want it. That's the center vents. This is high-low. This is vents without the AC, and you know, I don't know why it has to be so hard to read, uh, but it was obviously designed by the same people who did the Becker radio, which is also indecipherable. Yeah, I bet it's the best sports bar, so anyway, there it is. You got another ashtray here, nice stuff. Uh, you got Mercedes classic gated shifter. Uh, you got your power windows and mirrors. You got another little spot to put a weapon, and everything's great. You have a very classic looking uh, center view mirror there you've got nobody's opened those before uh, not in a while but you've got your 80s cocaine mirrors you've got a little flip down visor that covers the area that you know the sun might creep through otherwise all very classic and a giant big power sunroof uh, that uh, will definitely let in as much of the outside as you want to all very cool stuff and you see the perforation in the door panels uh, I should have said that when the door was open uh, you can see the climate control runs through this little tube here as well as of course some of the wiring uh, but what that'll do is emanate some of the air from behind so if you've got cold air conditioning going it'll shoot it into the door panels and then it'll sort of emanate from that perforation to uh, give you um, you know, to give you the, the comfort, you might not otherwise know where it's coming from. So, I'm telling you, man, the engineering in this car is just epic. Oh, and why the fader control has to be down here for the radio, I have absolutely no idea. <sighs> Keep our eye on that check engine. <laughs> you can't make this shit up. All right, here's Peter's slow gate wait patiently for that to open um, you know the ergonomics are just fantastic absolutely fantastic the dashboard has been designed for safety so uh, it's not going to break your kneecaps if you fly into it in an accident uh, everything about this car is just centered around being a great car the steering is recirculating ball which feels a bit 
stodgy and stiff by today's standards, but uh, to me is absolutely lovely. Uh, you can feel the pep out of that six, man. I mean, the gearing, uh, the smoothness is absolutely lovely. Uh, the shifting, and here's the biggest trick of the 124s, is if they've been maintained, and that is an if, because you can't just not maintain them. They do need maintenance. But if they have, if they've been looked after, I don't care what the odometer shows. Not only do you feel like the chairman of the board going down the road, the car still feels new. It still feels tight. You don't feel any rattles. You don't feel any wind noise. Feel wind noise. That's great. You don't hear it. Uh, you know, the bumps that you hit are kind of this imperceptible thing that you sense more than hear and feel. Uh, it is one of the finest suspension rigs that has ever been made and I would put it up against any modern car made today in terms of ride quality and feedback and joy of steering. I mean it is a terrific car to go down the road in. It really really is and uh, this car man does it come through in droves. I think part of that is the low mileage uh, part of it is that it's been looked after, uh, but I don't think it feels much different uh, than it would to the guy who drove it off the showroom floor back in 1989. You really wind out that six. And it moves, man. It gets up and it goes. And uh, that, of course, is another thing that differentiated it from the malaise cars uh, that were out that not much earlier. So. Man, I do love 124s. You know, of all, again, I get asked from time to time, what would you drive personally? What do I mean? I love my Chevy truck. It's the greatest vehicle in world history. It's what I want. But I mean, you put a gun to my head and say, what car would you drive on a daily basis if you're on a desert island somewhere that had roads and you could only have one car? Probably a 124. I don't know if it would be a wagon or a coupe, but it would be one of the two. And uh, I just think it's, in my world, it's definitely top three, uh, which is really saying something, because there's a lot of cars that I really, really love. But I mean, in terms of just being a fantastic car from one end of the spectrum to the other, <clears throat> it really is difficult to beat this thing. They are just that good. And uh, so there it is, yeah, okay, there's the answer at the end of the video. I do think it's the last true Mercedes-Benz that was built. I do think it's probably the best car that was ever built, uh, probably the most influential car, I mean, other Model T, whatever. But I, uh, I just think that this is uh, one of the great important cars uh, in world history. Just a fantastic piece in every regard, so. Um, this one is for sale at Auto House in Naples. You can give those guys a call. Uh, if you have an interest in it, they'll tell you what um, they'll tell you what you need to know about it. But uh, what a great piece, man! And what a fun thing to have taken home and driven and uh, done a review on. Uh, more fun stuff coming up. Uh, don't know if I'm going to get one tomorrow or not, but I'm going to try. And uh, we'll see. I'll certainly try to get one more at least by the end of the week. So thank you very much for having a look. Really, really appreciate it. Appreciate everything. And uh, we will uh, we'll see you in the, the next one. <laughs> Take care. And I'm going to go have some more uh, whiskey when I get to the shop to uh, make sure none of those bastards down there have that Omicron thing. Thank you again. See you next time.